Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 240. You know, we find ourselves in a very different place, my friends, than we were in in episode 239. Now we're all staying home in an effort to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope, I hope that this episode finds you and your family healthy and happy at home. And I tell you, more than ever, I am so grateful just to have this show and to know that we can still visit even when we're staying home. Now, I know that many of you listen in your car or while you're out and about, and boy, those things have changed. But uh, I'm very happy to be able to keep you company at home as well. So uh, you can do like I do. I love listening to podcasts when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm cooking, if I'm ironing, whatever we're doing around the house. So, So I am very, very glad that you have tuned in and that you're here with me now. And in fact, this whole situation has really motivated me to create another way that we can visit. So on March 26th, 2020, I launched a new online live show. It's called Elevenses with Lisa. Now, you're probably wondering, what are Elevenses? (laughs) Well, it's the traditional tea time at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I know that many of uh, you are in Australia and the UK and in Canada, and you're probably far more familiar with it than uh, your counterparts in the US. But it's a wonderful idea, isn't it? And who doesn't want to just take a break mid morning and get together and have some tea and talk about genealogy? So that sounds great to me. That's what we're going to do. I shared on episode one that I actually got the idea from um, uh, one of my favorite old TV shows from the 1970s. It was called Good Neighbors. I think it was called The Good Life in the UK. And uh, it's these two couples who live next door to each other. And one of them is striving to be self-sufficient in a suburban neighborhood. So they've quit their jobs. They've torn up their backyard and their front yard. And they're, they've planted a garden and brought in animals. And they're trying to make it on their own, just self-sustaining themselves. And um, the joke around their house is that the wife would go out to the garden with the tea at nine o'clock in the morning and say, Tom, it's nine o'clock, elevensies. <laughs> because their day started a lot earlier than most of our days, uh, the crack of dawn. So anyway, that always stuck in my head. And uh, somebody even mentioned to me that I guess Elevenses was something they did in The Hobbit or the, the Tolkien series. I don't know. I didn't see The Hobbit. Isn't that terrible? I didn't actually see that whole series. But anyway, however you may have heard of Elevenses or as I like to call it, Elevenses, um, that's what we're going to do in these Facebook Lives. Now, it's super easy to tune into the show. So As I say, right now, I'm doing the show as a Facebook Live on the Genealogy Gems podcast Facebook page. But I am thinking about moving the show to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel as a live show because you can do YouTube live as well. Uh, Because there's a lot of people, I know many of you are not on Facebook or don't want to spend time on Facebook. And honestly, I try to keep time on Facebook to a bare minimum. So stay tuned to the Genealogy Gems newsletter, because although we are doing it as Facebook Live right now, as of this episode, um, it's very likely that we are going to move the live show over to YouTube. And we'll be announcing uh, the schedule and where to find it in the weekly Genealogy Gems newsletter. Now, I do always record that show as well. So you can always watch it uh, in either place. The video will appear both at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel and also the Genealogy Gems podcast page over at Facebook. And speaking of our free newsletter, if you haven't signed up for it, maybe you're new to the show, put that on your to-do list today. Do do it right now while you're listening to me, okay? Get online, go to genealogygems.com. At the top of the page, click to uh, join up on the newsletter. We do a weekly free newsletter 
lots of great content there. And it's our number one communication tool. That's how you and I stay in touch about anything that changes around here. And my goodness, these days, things do change. And I tell you, Elevensies with Lisa uh, has been an absolute blast to do. It's a pleasant surprise. I didn't know what I was getting into, okay? Um, And your response uh, has been amazing. I honestly didn't know when I did the first episode if I was going to do more than one episode. I really didn't. But your feedback and your comments let me know loud and clear that you enjoyed it. You're looking forward to it. And I know that I look forward to each and every episode. So that's what we're going to do every week on Thursdays. 11 a.m. Central. So be sure to go Google a time zone calculator if you're not sure when 11 a.m. Central is for your time. Um, But that's what time we're going to meet up. And like I said, if by chance you're working during that time or you're busy, we do create a video and put that in both locations. I love the show live and I love when you uh, attend live because that's when we get some real live conversation. And you can ask your questions and leave comments. And it's it's just awesome, because that's what it's supposed to be about. It's a way to get together in person. Today, we are getting together. And we are uh, doing lots of things in this podcast episode. So I've got a couple of videos for you that I recorded while at Roots Tech 2020. Oh my gosh, that seems an eon ago. (laughs) But it really wasn't. I mean, I'm recording April 6th. That was uh, what, the end of February? Oh my gosh. Time moves so quickly, doesn't it? And there has been so much on our minds. Um, I think it's kind of overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, it was the end of February. So anyway, that was just when the coronavirus was really getting on everybody's radar. And I know that that week we were concerned because we were all getting together in one big, huge place. It's probably one of the last big events to be held before everything shut down. But we got some great interviews and some fun people to talk to while we were at Roots Tech. And we did that at the Genealogy Gems booth. So first up, I have for you Lisa Lisson. She's from the Are You My Cousin blog. And she's going to talk about organization. Oh, did that ring your bell? <laughs> we all want to get more organized. She has ideas on how to stay focused, how to get organized, and and she'll share a little bit about how she set up her own system. And then I've got Andrew Lee. Now he's from Family History Fanatics, another YouTube channel. He joined us in the booth and we got a chance to sit down and do kind of a DNA Q&A. And uh, he's written a book by the same title. He had lots of answers for lots of DNA questions. So we're going to dig into that. And then I've got a great conversation. It's really the feature interview this episode. It's with Kate Ekman of Legacy Tree Genealogists. We're going to talk about evidence and proof and whether you have enough. (laughs) If you've ever wondered how much is enough, how much is not enough, Is all evidence the same? These are all important questions for the genealogist, and that's what we're going to do in this episode. So let's jump right into it. Our first conversation is with Lisa Lisson of Are You My Cousin? So today we're talking to Lisa Lisson, and she is the founder, the blogger extraordinaire for Are You My Cousin? Hi, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. Lisa is the author of The Genealogy Planner, and I think, Lisa, I would guess that you wrote this because this is one of the number one questions that we as genealogists get when we're speaking at these events. Absolutely. It's one of the, it is one of the number one questions that my readers actually email me about. They always want to know how to organize. And you talk on all different kinds of topics, so that's saying something that they really jump out and say, help. (laughs) I do, I do. I talk on a large number of topics, and it always seems to come back to organization and planning. Well, I wanted to ask you about some some questions about this, because I think I probably have some ideas of the kinds of questions that people have, and people listening, because we are recording this for the podcast, which you can listen to in your podcast app on your smartphone, whether it's Apple or Android. And we have an app in the App Store. 
So why do you say, and I heard you say this and I was a little surprised, you flunked out at planning and organizing your genealogy research? You flunked out? I flunked out and I flunked out many times because I, I'm a kind of an organizing junkie and I love to read podcasts about organizing things. It, it could be anything, genealogy, your house, your kids, whatever. And I would always kind of go after that next best thing. The next, this one's gonna solve all your problems. And I always would fail. I would always start it out, but I could never, ever. Well, that makes me feel better because I've done that a couple times. Because, well, the reason is because I kept trying to put myself into somebody else's system and it wasn't working for me. And so that's when I started realizing I needed to understand the concepts. I didn't need the the step by step. I wanted to understand the concepts and then build my own step by steps that worked for me. So is that the premise of kind of how you put this together, the planner? Absolutely. So that's what I've tried to do in the planner is to show you how to, what good habits are, because a lot of times we think genealogy organization is a one-time project. It has right. a beginning, I'll get it done, and then I'm good to go. Well, that's, that's a really... Nothing could be farther from the truth. That's right. It's not. It's a mindset thing. It's not a um, one-time deal. It is a process and it's a system. So when I understood that... I could start to build my own systems to put together. So what I've done in the book is to show how I've gone about building those systems. I show you what I do, and then if they work for you, fantastic. If you need to tweak them, you're good to go. You know, I love that because you know when I teach on Google Search, I did three classes here. I kept telling people this could change tomorrow. You know, something could could be different. And so concepts are the most important thing. It's great to do the step by step, and mm -hmm. that helps us today. But if it changes, you still have to engage the brain and think about the overarching concepts that will still guide you to right. find success. Let's see. I also had why having the right mindset. You were talking about this mindset. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And keeping your information organized. How would you summarize? What's a, an overarching idea behind the concept of the mindset that you say that you have now? The, it's kind of a two-part answer. So it is that mindset of there's no one right answer I need and there's no beginning to to the project and there's no end to the project because it's not a project it's a system and then the other side of that would be making sure I create systems that are consistent so if I am okay. creating a labeling system that works for me and as long as I label everything in that system each time I'm good to go I'm not reinventing the wheel I was spending too much time reinventing the wheel on how to <laughs> I organize. I hear a lot about that. I'm doing a do-over. I'm doing do a do-over. <laughs> well, the problem was, you know, I couldn't like, well, how did I label that document in my files that time? And then it would take me 10 minutes to find it to figure out how to label again. So I created that system to label everything the same way every time. And now I know how to search into my database to find so it. So you're not telling your readers exactly what the words have to be, but you're guiding them to the ones that are most important and what to put them in the order they can remember? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is nothing magical in how you name the file. But if you name a file, and whether it's your paper file or whether it's in your, your digital file, and you don't remember how to find it, it's really no good for you. Yeah. So it's how you think and how you want how you would normally look at it. Ask yourself when you're labeling, if I need to come back and find this next week, what would I look for? Right. What would a search would I prepare? And that's kind of how I start to build my labels. One of my favorite things is to put the year in the in the file name first. It mm -hmm. automatically puts everything in chronological order. Actually, I do that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny, it does double duty. Now, let me see here. I have, what do you think the most important habit is that we need to cultivate? Because you talked about the importance of habits. Mm -hmm. It keeps us consistent. When we're trying to stay on track, what's one of the most important habits? Or that may, may one that you developed or had to conquer? Yeah. Well, it really was just being consistent. It's very, I had to be very consistent. So I would develop the habit and I would literally write down beside me what that labeling system was. So when I developed my own personal labeling system for files, I kept a, a sheet of paper on my desk and I would, oh. with the system, so that I could develop that habit. Do you organize as you go or are you organizing like, I'm gonna start my day 20 minutes, I'm gonna get everything together or 20 minutes at the end and try to pull it all together? Or are you doing it throughout? 
I kind of do it throughout. Okay. Um, I do. Th- I do plan ahead, but then I'm also flexible enough to move in and out of it. I'll never forget working for a gal, and she taught me early on. She'd look at me and she'd say, "Don't touch that paper more than once. Don't you touch that right. paper?" And I went, "What? What?" And she's like, "If you touch it." You need to have a purpose what you're going to do. And if you're going to file it, if you're going to throw it away, if you're going to work with it, but pick it up, put it down, put it in 16 different piles, mm-hmm. isn't really working. And it's wasting time. Right. It's wasting time. And so if you do an on-site research project and you come home with a stack of copies of papers, I treat them the same way. I, I'll go through digitize and I label them the same way and I file them the same way. I don't even think about it anymore. Yeah. It is just a habit, and I can do it in a fraction of the time that it used to take me to do it. So when I think about organizing, I'm thinking about not just the stuff when you're done with it, but actually organizing your approach to research. Mm-hmm. Do you, let's be honest, do you really create a research plan when you're going to try to find something mm-hmm. and say, I'm going to map this out, I'm going to invest the time, before, you know, because I get excited, I want to go start searching right now. Do you do a research plan as a genealogist? I do a research plan Every right single answer. time. Good answer. I actually had a reader who goes, Lisa, are you really serious? Do you really <laughs> do one every... And I'm like, yeah, I do. Because I found myself in the weeds on that research, mm-hmm. and I was wasting time. If you don't have a plan, you're going to end up with something else. or you're, It cost me money. Yeah. Time and money when That's I don't research look that it. plan. Because yeah. if you, it, when I take a trip, if I'm taking a road trip, whether it's to the archives which I actually live close to in North Carolina or if I'm going a distance away if I go without a plan I come home and I'm not I don't have everything I don't have all the documents I went for I got sidetracked or I forgot to get something and then I have to do it all again and so it costs time and money to go back and redo the research I didn't do the first time I can't agree more and when I was teaching um, the Google class I've added a research plan for the actual Google search now yes. because it's critical, you know, and uh, searches of all kinds are getting more complicated and there's so many different options and you got to have a way to track. Yes. You mentioned workflow and I, I had to ask you that before I let you go on the genealogy planner book workflow. What is that? How do we do that? Okay. So a workflow is really just my way of talking about a system that I have. And so I set up workflows. So for when I research at my computer, Every workflow I have starts with a research plan, creating a research plan. And then I have a workflow for how I'm going to, to do my research at the archives. And so, you know, an example of that might be the first part of that workflow is the research plan. And then when I get to the archives, I know exactly what I'm going to do when I get there. I know exactly what records I'm going to go and ask them to pull. And then I'll start my research that way. And then when I leave the archives, I know exactly how it, it tells me how I'm going to deal with those records when I get back home and how I'm going to file them. The reason I love the sound of that is because workflows help you not miss something. Yes. Uh, I, I know in the old days, I would do willy-nilly, and I'd go, oh, my gosh, how did I forget that? What did I do with that? Oh, I, and, and when you have a workflow, it's like you can go a little more into autopilot on the mundane things, yes. and you can put all the gray matter towards the exciting research analysis part. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm handing you your book. I want you to tell the folks listening and the folks are who have gathered here mm-hmm. at Roots Tech what this book is going to do for them. Is it going to solve a problem? It is going to help solve a problem. It is not going to give you that step-by-step that you do this and you will get X, but it is going to show you how to put systems in place, how to think in terms of, of systems and habits as opposed to one-time projects. It also comes with checklists that you can copy and create little I have readers who will create little small binders for certain lines. So they'll take checklists that are pertinent for one line and create a little binder for that, or they'll create and take others that might be pertinent for a different line. So I've got plenty of checklists in here. I have samples of what you can see exactly what my workflows are, guys. I share that out there. If they Yay, work, for, if they I want if, to see them, <laughs> and if, if if you try that workflow and it works for you, fantastic. But maybe you try it and think ah, that works for her, but I need to tweak it a little bit. Tweak it, okay? As tweak, long it, as, tweak it consistently. Right? Tweak it consistently and make sure it's something you use for yourself. What I do tell you, and I mentioned in the book, is give yourself some time. It takes time to develop that system. Don't judge it by just the day one of your systems. Wise words. Thank I you. love it. And tell them where they can find your book. You can find it online at my website, Are You My Cousin? And it's lisalisten.com. Lisa, listen, L-I-S-S-O-N dot com. 
and Lisa Lisson. Thank you so much. It has been so much fun to work together in the booth together. Oh, here at I've Roots had Tech. so much fun. So we got to do something else together in the soon. Okay, I think we do. All yes, right. thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Lisa's generously offered a 20% discount to all of you Genealogy Gems listeners. Use the coupon code PLANNER20. Again, that's PLANNER20 to get 20% off. Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, my heritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Andy, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen each other. You guys, your YouTube channel's going gangbusters. Your new book has been flying out of the booth the entire time we've been here, and it's DNA q and I imagine that doing your Family History Fanatics YouTube channel generates questions, comments, and then, of course, you go and you speak, and you get even more. What are some of the most common questions that you're getting about DNA? Well, by far, the most common question is always, which company should I test with? And everybody that has not tested with DNA has that question to begin with, because there's lots of options out there. You have Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, Living DNA, as well as some others. And the simple answer is all of them. Ah. Every single one of them. That sounds expensive, Andy. That can <laughs> get expensive. And so there's some strategies that you can use. Great. to actually get in all of the databases. So the first thing to understand is that Ancestry and 23andMe, they don't allow transfers from other companies. You can, you can export your results from those two companies, mm -hmm. but if you've tested at another company, you can't import it into Ancestry oh. or 23andMe. Cool. So the only way to be in those two databases is to test with them. I see. You have to pay for those tests, but they usually have sales, so look for the $49 sales or the $59 sales. Those two tests now you spend $100 on. Those prices have been dropping, haven't they? They have. And just a couple of years ago, you were looking at $99. and Easily. That was what it was. So we've gone from $200 now to $100 right. for those two tests. So that's the first thing you do. You just test with those two companies. And then you can download your results from either one of them. And you can upload those results to Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and Living DNA as well as some third-party applications. Family Tree DNA to have full access to their tools, I believe is only like $19 on a transfer. And that's really the benefit, isn't it? They want to build their database, but they do have specialized tools, and that's a huge advantage. Exactly, exactly. And, and my heritage, theirs is only $29. So you've mm -hmm. only added $50 on top of that 100 Right. So for $150, you can now be in every single one of the databases. Wow. And the yeah. reason why that's important is because you don't know where your relatives are. Or who they, they tested with, Or right? who they tested with. So you need to be in all the databases. You know, a lot of genealogists are starting to feel like, well, it sounds like, you know, everybody's importing and exporting here and there, so don't I just need one at this point? But there's a lot of people who never even hardly look at their match list. They tested because they saw a commercial and want to know what their pie chart looks like. So you're saying it's still worth being in all these places because... There are unique users in each location? There are. And I think that um, part of it is is there's there's a, a core of genealogists who test everywhere, and they're right. going to be in all the databases. Right. But that's not the majority of any of the databases. Um, Ancestry, I think right now, is somewhere around 20 million people in their database. Right. And uh, 23andMe is around 15 million. Oh, okay. There's probably only about 2 or 3 million overlap between those two databases. So there's a significant amount that is unique to each one of those databases. Wow. Now, we just heard, I just saw on the news, um, and I was reporting on it on the podcast, that 23andMe had a big layoff 
as well as Ancestry, and they're quoting that this has to do with the decline in DNA kit sales. Because in a sense, everybody who kind of that's on their radar, they've done it. And so what do you see in the future? I'm kind of thinking the tools may be the, the way to keep it all afloat is to create improved tools. What do you see as far as what's going to happen in the future? Well, I think one thing to, to realize with this is that while they have had to lay off and while growth of the number of people in the database is declining, mm -hmm. there's still more kits being added every year okay. to both of those databases than there was four years ago. Oh, okay. So, yes, it's less than it was last year and it's less than it was in 2018. Those were really the heydays when everybody <laughs> oh, yeah. was testing. It was like it was never going to end. But, huge lines. Yeah, but it's still two or three times what it was just four or five years ago. Okay. So, slower growth, but still growth. Um, so that's one thing that you, we want to be seeing. But the other thing I think is is that a lot of the people who were testing in this big growth phase were the ones who were just looking for the pie chart, just wanted to see whether they're Scottish or German. And a lot of it had to do with the advertising that was done around that. Yeah. A lot of the tools that are coming out now are absolutely amazing, not only on the different websites, but also with third-party applications. And so being able to utilize those tools I think is really important for genealogists who want to add a DNA record to their toolbox. And that's interesting because I think you hear genetic genealogists talking about this is a record. And when DNA first got going and it was just booming, it was like it's everything and there's nothing else and everybody was so hyper-focused on it. But really it's this one piece in the continued toolbox. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about DNA in terms of particularly in genealogy and the usage of the results in their overall family history work? So I think one of the first things is that DNA is often underestimated. Okay. Now we talk about it as a record and what DNA is, is it's a record of relationships. Unlike almost all the other records that we use in genealogy, there's no names in the DNA. Right. There's no dates in DNA. There's no places in DNA. But when we take living people and we identify who those people are and their DNA, those people have a name, a date, and a place. Mm -hmm. And they, a lot of times, have a family tree that has more names, dates, and places. But what that DNA tells us is where people can fit in on that family tree. And unlike another record, and one that I like to compare it to is like, say, for instance, a probate record or, you know, a court record that lists out lots of family members, lots of property, lots of really good genealogical information. You might have, you know, 15 or 20 people listed in a probate record that can help you on your family tree. Well, your DNA test, particularly with all the millions that are out there now, is literally identifying you with thousands of other relatives. Right. So it's not one record, it's thousands of records. And the goal would be that those thousands potentially of people would have information as well. Exactly. And there's a, there's a, it's a collaboration kickstart. And some of those aren't. For instance, if, if uh, people find out that they're adopted or if they you know, have known sure. that all their lives, they don't know who their biological parents are. But other people have these family trees that link up to a common ancestor that can help adoptees find out more information about their biological ancestors. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the book is called DNA Q&A. Are you up for any questions from our live audience? Here? Absolutely. Do we have any questions any from questions our live on audience? DNA? So I'll repeat the question, and that is she's um, got somebody who showed up as a first cousin match, and yet you're talking to the family and they're going, I don't know who this guy is. So, how does that happen? What would be a possible explanation, and maybe what kind of a guidance would you tell them if literally nobody she knows knows this person? Well, the first thing to understand is DNA doesn't lie. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a big uh oh. <laughs> On the other hand, DNA does not tell you the whole truth. Correct. So, when you have a close match like this, like first cousins, there's only a few relationships that that match could be. For instance, it could be a half aunt or uncle, it could be, you know, some other things that are still pretty close. Now, in this lady's case, nobody in the family knows who this person is. More than likely, somewhere along the line at the grandparent level, possibly the great-grandparent level, there was another child. Now, this child was not known in the family. This child might have been given up for adoption for some reason. This child might have been from an affair. This child might have been from you know any number of things, sure. but just was not part of that family. 
Well, their descendants have grown up and one of them is tested. And that child biologically is part of the family. It's really now up to other testing with the family to narrow down where that child could be, finding out who the father or mother of that child if is. If the testing company is telling her, this is your first cousin, is it possible they're not, they're a second? Is it, is it for sure when we get that kind of level? So it depends on how much shared DNA you have. So first cousins, on average, share somewhere around 800 centimorgans. But when you actually look at a, a large range of first cousins, they share anywhere from 500 up to 1,300 centimorgans. Second cousins, on the other hand, on average, they share about 250 centimorgans. But they have a range that's you know, down to around 100 centimorgans, all the way up to 500 and sometimes even 600 centimorgans. So it's entirely possible that it could be a second cousin. It could be a first cousin once removed. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably not down to a first cousin twice removed, but maybe if it was just on the very narrow edge of it, you really don't know at this point until you do more of that genealogy research to find out where they fit into that tree. Interesting. A very but good question. Thank at, you. at that close of a level, they are definitely related to your family. You can't really have a mistake at that <laughs> you level. You can't fake that, huh? No. I have a question that I spotted in the book. All right. And it says, your advice strongly emphasizes testing the oldest generation first. Is this always best? Do different rules apply to Y-DNA, mitochondrial, and other kinds of DNA tests? So in general, this almost always applies. And the reason is, is because each generation, you're only passing on half of your DNA. So for instance, I only have half of my mother's DNA and I only have half of my father's DNA. So if they're still living, getting their DNA is gonna be better than getting my DNA. Right. Now, if one of them is passed on, well then I might have the only bit of that DNA left to be able to test. Now with Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, it passes down usually several generations without being changed. And so testing yourself or your father or your grandfather is probably going to get the same result. However, that's if you know that you are biologically descended from them. What you may find by taking a Y-DNA test and then testing your grandfather is he's not your biological grandfather. That changes the game. And that changes the game. So I would almost always advocate testing the oldest generation first. And if you have the money, then test the younger generations as well. Okay. Well, the book is DNA Q&A. To wrap things up, tell folks that are here and listening, what problem will this solve for them? So this is unlike a lot of the other DNA books on the market. It's not necessarily going to teach you how to do DNA research. What it is, is it's literally going to answer your questions. The book is made up, like you started at the beginning, of all these questions that we had on our YouTube channel, in classes that we've taught about DNA. And so it, it covers the whole gambit of topics on DNA. And there's questions about almost everything that you could think of. So if you have a question about DNA, it, it's probably in there. <laughs> it might be in there. And if it's not, it's probably going to be in the second edition. And tell us where folks can find you online. So folks can find us on YouTube at Family History Fanatics. Um, we can also find us at our blog, blog.familyhistoryfanatics.com. And I'm not sure where else, but my wife would know. <laughs> she would. So, Andy, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I hope you'll come back on the show sometime soon. I'm sure we have more questions for you. All right. Would be glad to. Thanks so much. Thank you. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree. 
and get those Ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at RootsMagic.com. So how do we know when we've compiled enough evidence to constitute proof? I mean, is a birth certificate or an autosomal DNA test result sufficient to declare that this person is the child of that person? Do we have to collect every single record regarding an individual, like the deeds and the tax list, the newspaper clippings, the census, before we can declare a familial connection with confidence? I've invited Kate Ekman, a senior researcher at Legacy Tree Genealogist, back to the podcast to help answer these questions, which you may have about evidence and proof. Welcome back, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I'm so pleased to have you back here. I think this is such an important topic. And, you know, according to the genealogical proof standard, which we know is the GPS, as genealogists, we should perform reasonably exhaustive research. And that requires that we identify and review all available records related to an individual. And that sounds a little daunting. I know we want to be thorough and want to be accurate as possible. But I know that many of the people who are listening to us right now are maybe thinking to themselves, well, you know, life is short. I don't always have weeks and months and years to focus on completely documenting one person in the family tree before I want to move on to the next one. So Kate, what are some of the goals that you hear from your clients? And how do those different goals impact how much time and effort that you think is reasonable in order to, you know, feel confident that we are building an accurate family tree? Well, that's a really great question, Lisa. And I think that while I am a huge fan of the GPS and I love digging in and finding every record and writing all that I can about an individual, the reality is, as you said, that we want to see something for the work we do. We want our tree to start to grow. We want to see those branches extend out. And it is discouraging to see and be told, you have to do everything for your grandfather before you can move on. Um, My belief is that the client establishes the goals And my responsibility is to be as efficient and as effective as I can in accomplishing those goals. And sometimes that means that I don't uncover every document for each ancestor before I move on to the next. I imagine you hear a lot of different goals. I mean, I know just from the emails that I get from my listeners, um, we have people in this audience who are professionals. We have people who are trying to join the DAR. Um, We have folks who are just doing this in their car on their phone while they're waiting for the kids to get done with soccer practice. And my feeling is, I don't know about you, but I want everybody to feel like they can participate, even if they can't participate at the level of every single possible stone unturned before you can possibly move on. I agree. When we have a client who, as you said, wants to just simply join the DAR or the Mayflower Society, to accomplish that goal, we're focusing on a specific line of that family, not every individual in that person's family tree. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll have people who want to just identify who their immigrant ancestors are or their most recent immigrant ancestor. And so they aren't looking for all the detail of every person in their family tree. They're looking for, you've heard the phrase before, I'm sure, with when you've talked with Paul Woodbury about DNA research is that sometimes you are making quick and dirty trees. Um, we're just trying to get the bare minimum to be able to feel confident that we've connected one generation to the next, Um, which is not to say that sometimes we don't write those lavish, wonderful narrative reports that outline everything about a 
person's life. I love doing those, but that's not what everybody needs or wants. And it's important that we uh, help everybody feel like genealogy is something they can do. I love that idea. And it reminds me a lot about online family trees. You know, how people will look at an online family tree and, and kind of sit in judgment and say, oh, that's a hot mess. What are they doing? They, I can't believe they're doing that. And we forget lots of people have different purposes for their online family trees. And they may be at different stages and they may come at it in different stages. I mean, I imagine not every single tree that you build online as you're doing professional <laughs> research is, is perfect when people run into it, is it? Oh, no, I I would hate for anyone to look at my trees that I build when I get started because I'm theorizing. Mm -hmm. I have records collected for two different fathers because I'm not sure which one is the right John Johnson or whatever. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only person who does that, that we're – collecting records, we're comparing information, and then we can make our decisions. So an online family tree can be a mess. It, it can look terrible. But if you spend the time looking at it, you're usually going to be able to figure out what the, the person who created it is trying to accomplish. Exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Okay, so all that being said, we know we have a wide range of different listeners and different goals in mind. Um, but it does come back to, I think we all share one thing, we would like it to be right. <laughs> We'd like it to be as accurate as possible. So you laid out some really helpful guidelines in the guest post that you that we published here at genealogygems.com. Um, so I'd love to cover some of these guidelines that will help us to kind of weigh and evaluate what we're doing in terms of our evidence and establishing proof so that we can feel good about what we're doing, even if we're just dabbling, or even if we're all the way on the end with the professionals. I think that these guidelines really help demonstrate how we can go about compiling necessary information to say with confidence, of course, this person is my ancestor. So the first guideline that you put together in that post was one record or one source is never enough. What do you mean by that? It's very easy for one record to tell us anything. And what it says may not be true. We might have a mother who lies about her child's birth certificate for any number of reasons. We might have a grieving spouse who can't correctly recall all of the information for their husband or wife's death certificate. There are typos. There are um, unintentional omissions. There's messy handwriting that we have to read. Even a single DNA test, just standing alone, is not sufficient to prove a family connection. We really need to have more than one source that, uh, that agrees that with, th with each other, more than one source that corroborates what the other source says, to be able to say successfully and confidently that this is the accurate information about this person. I think this is such an important message, particularly for the soccer mom in, in the car, who is having a wonderful time and enjoying working with the various genealogy apps, and, and she's finding some records. But it'd be really easy, particularly sitting there in an app, to find a record and go, awesome. Okay, next step. But of course, we want them to go find another piece of evidence. And that's really what you're talking about, right? It's it's and it's really a good reminder for all of us, no matter how solid a record looks, there still is underlying information about the creation of that record that may actually mean that parts of it are just not right. That's exactly right. Um, and so that's why I encourage folks to find at least two records, um, a census report, and autosomal DNA test, or a deed and a will, or you might have a birth certificate and an obituary. Any combination is acceptable. You're just looking for two different kinds of things, two different kinds of records to confirm that you have the right information. Yeah, and I like that uh, example that you gave in the post. You have a marriage license, and it says 
John Weiss and Griselda Paul. And, and I know I've seen people do this. They'll see the marriage license. Great. They go to look for the actual record of the marriage. Well, now they can't find it. Well, they assume, oh, okay, well, maybe that got lost or whatever. But you can't just go on a marriage license because you could apply for a marriage license and never actually get married, right? That's exactly right. And we see those in newspapers, especially. We'll see yeah. a newspaper listing of marriage licenses. And that's a fantastic clue. And it's a great uh, indicator to help us know what to look for and where and when, but it's not a guarantee. John and Griselda may have taken out that marriage license and had a fight on their way to the church <laughs> and, um, and never married. So the license tells us they intended to, but it, it's not evidence of the marriage having occurred. Right. So not even not every piece of evidence we find is of equal weight. L let's look at number two, because you talk about the more contemporary the source is to the person or event in question, the better it is. And that goes to this whole idea of, you know, not all sources and evidence are of equal, you know, standing or value. T tell us a little bit about that. Records of events that are made immediately after the event tend to be more accurate simply because our recollection is fresher. We can provide more specific details about what we did an hour ago than what we did a week ago today. And as time progresses, we begin to forget those details. We confuse two similar events that happened at around the same time. Um, we just, um, our memory fades. So it's important to have a record as close to the event or the, to the person's life as possible so that everyone who is involved in creating that record has the best ability to provide the most accurate information. So in other words, if we find a record, but it, you know, it's a report three weeks later, that's not a good place to stop. We need to go back and keep digging versus if you um, find a couple of ones that are really solid and right about the time that happened, we can give those a little more weight, right? Right. For instance, family Bibles, those are wonderful treasure troves for any genealogist. And we love having them because they can provide us names and birth dates and marriage dates and death dates and children and parents. But a family Bible that has been completed by the grandchildren, writing down what they remember their parents and grandparents telling them, is not the same thing as the family Bible where you can tell somebody wrote the entry in in pencil and then the next entry is in pen and it's a different hand writing yeah. it from one to the other. That family Bible filled out as the events occurred, as the children were born and they got married. That's a much more useful tool for us because it's more likely to be accurate. And I imagine alongside of the timing... It's also about who the person was who created the record. Like, oh. is it a reporter in a newspaper who heard about it from the neighbor next door? Or was it the actual spouse of that person? That's exactly right. Is It's important to think about who created that record and what information they would know. Um, a parent is more likely to be aware of the date of birth of the child <laughs> than... A cousin is, for instance. Yes. Um, in general, that's why we look at it. But it's also important to consider as you're looking at these records, if you're looking at two records that are potentially created by the same person. So the obituary was written by the children and the headstone was authorized to be created by the children. If the children misunderstood or misremembered when dad was born, then we're going to see the same incorrect date in both the obituary and on the headstone. And so we have to be aware of who's creating those records and looking for different authors to help us. I like that. I like that because uh, we can get excited about the source. And you're saying take that extra step to make sure you're looking to see who's making it. That's a really good point. 
somebody who got it wrong the first time is likely to get it wrong the second time. So, you know, and, and this kind of takes us to the third guideline that you mentioned in uh, the post, which is it's okay to make appropriate assumptions, but be careful. And I think this is so interesting because I think we often make assumptions we don't even really realize we're making an assumption. It just feels so solid. It feels so real. But in actuality, we've jumped ahead a little bit in in making assumptions about something. Tell us a little more about that and some of the examples you had. Certainly. We make, as you said, we make assumptions all the time. And I like what you said about that we're not even aware that we're making that assumption because it just seems like this must be so. Mm-hmm. So, Appropriate assumptions are almost, I'm thinking almost like mathematical proofs. They're givens. You can't be born after you die. Right. You can't have a child after you die. Your uh, your child can't be born 10 years after your death. So when we see that sort of information, we assume that it's uh, this is a, the wrong person or the wrong date. And that's an appropriate assumption to make. Um, there are biological considerations. Uh, a 90-year-old woman is not going to have a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an appropriate assumption to make. But there are some other assumptions that we make that are really unfounded assumptions. We see a list of family members in the census. Um, I'm thinking like the 1860 census where there's nothing to indicate how anybody is related to each other. It's a man and then a woman and then five children. And we say a husband, wife, children. But that census report doesn't tell us that's a husband and wife. It could be brother and sister, and the sisters moved in to help take care of widowed brother's children. Um, It could be a second wife, and half the children are hers from her first marriage. So we make those assumptions and they can get us in trouble because we do that. And I think it's particularly easy to do that when it's sort of confirming something we already thought was true, right? That I think that makes us vulnerable when it actually seems to back up the story that we we believe we're uncovering. And we can then therefore miss something because it seems to be validating what we already thought was true. That's exactly right. You're talking about confirmation bias, and we're all guilty of that. We have an idea in our heads that Margaret was John's wife, and Margaret was John's only wife. And if we find a record that says Margaret's his wife in 1850 and Margaret's his wife in 1860, it never crosses our minds to wonder, is there a second wife named Margaret? Um, So confirmation bias is really important to Uh, be aware of and try to avoid. You know, it's interesting as we're going through this uh, conversation, the guidelines, and I'm thinking about there are people who just work on their family tree um, on a website, let's say, and and they're putting all their information. And you almost can't do that, really. I mean, this kind of goes back to making the case for why I think we all need our own software database. We need our own note-taking systems because it's more complicated than it looks at first clients, isn't it? It really is. I'll use an online database to build my trees for my clients, but I also have, um, I'm very old-fashioned, I have paper and pencil notes um, in the folder about each one of those records. I've collected the records because I don't want to have to look for them a second time, but I make my notes about my questions or my concerns about that record and its fitness for um, the research I'm doing and what it might be telling me uh, that I need to be aware of. So I love the fact that we have such easy access to online information and it's so very easy to attach records and move on. But I hope that we would all take the time to really pay attention to what the record says. Um, And as you suggested, have a secondary method of keeping track of what we have and why. Right. And I could see how, you know, just these things we're talking about, things like confirmation bias, that 
may end up backing us into a, a brick wall corner. We didn't even know we could put ourselves there. And I I imagine you probably say that because as a professional, in a way, you have the advantage. You are kind of detached uh, emotionally from the family or emotionally from all the hard work that went into it thus far. And you're probably able to see these things probably more quickly than the person who was doing the initial research and help people get on track. Is that kind of part of what you do? Definitely. Um, I think all of us and even professionals benefit by having someone else look at our research, especially when we run into a brick wall. Because so often the client sends us something and I can look at it and I immediately spot where there's that one little piece of information that makes a difference that they overlooked or just ignored because they didn't understand it or didn't quite fit in. Um, So having somebody else look at it helps a lot to overcome the biases or the um, the misunderstandings that we might have made in reviewing and analyzing the records. Yeah, I, I get lots of emails from from folks who will say, Oh, I'm just at this brick wall, this record just doesn't exist. And, and oftentimes, and it's hard to tell people, you know, it's possible that you've, in a sense, placed yourself in a place where, of course, it doesn't exist because you're actually a little bit off. You were off maybe a person or a generation ago. And that's why it gets stuck. So I love that. I love that idea of having a secondary person, whether it's a friend or you just hire, uh, you know, for an hour consult with a professional like you to say, take a look at this and make sure that I didn't already paint myself in a left hand corner when I should really be over (laughs) on the right. (laughs) That's exactly right. We can help avoid painting ourselves into the corner by following those steps that I, we've talked about, choosing more than one source, getting sources as close to the event as possible. But even after you have done that and you've been very careful and meticulous, sometimes, as you said, you do need to have a professional just look over what you've done. And that's something that professionals can do is provide an, an hour consultation. Look at your tree find where maybe you, the the error has crept in. Yeah, absolutely. Well worth the investment. And the fourth and final guideline that you provided to us on, on the blog post is that all of the data from the various sources must correlate, and there can be no unresolved contradictions. Talk a little bit about that, because I imagine you run into that quite a bit too. We do. Sometimes it's very easy. The birth certificate says the same date as the marriage record. This says the same date as the the draft registration. Everything coincides and it lines up beautifully and there's never any questions about it. Other times you get a record and the name keeps changing. It's slightly different from place to place. It's Joseph C., then it's J.C., then it's J. Clifton. Are those all the same person? Um, Am I making an assumption? Am I falling into the dangers of confirmation bias and assuming they're all the same person? So we have to be able to look at those places where the information varies and be able to explain, oh, he did prefer to go by his middle name. He was given a name by his parents, but he didn't like his first name. And so we can see that when he got became an adult, he went by Clifton instead of Joseph. Um, so we can explain that contradiction. We can explain contradictions of census reports by being aware of how the census information was gathered by the enumerators, what they were told to ask. Um, because sometimes the questions are slightly different. It might be, how old are you now? Or it could be, how old will you be on your next birthday? And by just paying a little bit more attention to what the question asks on the census can help us to resolve those contradictions. Is there ever a case, do you feel like that you can you can go ahead and feel confident moving forward, even when there is one? Is it possible that there's a contradiction sitting there just because uh, they just got it terribly wrong in some form? How do we know that we can go ahead and set that aside and we have enough, you know, that fill out this whole scenario to feel confident about moving forward? That's a great question. 
And the answer for that is if I only have two records and they disagree, I need a third record. Mm -hmm. And I might need a fourth record or a fifth record or a sixth record. And when I have the preponderance of evidence that tells me Richard was born in 1914 and he married Sarah, I can ignore the record that says, or or I can explain away the record that says that um, Richard was born in 1904 and he married Samantha by saying maybe it was bad handwriting. Um, or it's clearly... This record that has the wrong names and dates is clearly a transcript of another record. You can look at the other entries and see it's all the same perfect handwriting. Somebody's copied from one record to another and maybe just made a mistake. But we have to collect a lot of records before we can make that determination. Great point. So when we see contradictions, it means don't stop, keep moving, you might be able to then set one of them aside because you know you have, like you say, an abundance of evidence to solidify moving forward to the next ancestor or going back in time. I imagine over time and experience, some of this grows within us as a genealogist that we can gain confidence. Uh, when we practice this on a daily basis, then we grow in wisdom when it comes to evaluating records. That's exactly right. The example that we talked about of John and Griselda taking out their marriage license, we can only know for sure that they married if we find a copy of their marriage record. Well, that's not the only way to do it. That's the most obvious way. But we can also find other records that will confirm that. Perhaps a second marriage of Griselda where she lists her first husband as John. So even if we don't have all of the records that we would hope to have by collecting additional records, we can make that final determination. We can say, I don't have a marriage record for John and Griselda. I see they took out a marriage license. And later, Griselda had a second marriage. And she said, my first husband was a man named John. And so that's how we can verify that John and Griselda did marry. Wonderful. Well, I think this post that you wrote for us is just a wonderful kind of roadmap, if you will. And I encourage everybody listening to head to the show notes for this episode, because I've got a link there that will take you over to read the complete article, which Kate gives you some really great examples. And you can look at the records themselves. You can, I think it will kind of open your eyes and help you to go back and kind of maybe do a quick audit of what you've been doing in your own research. And of course, Kate, if they get really stuck, or they need that fresh set of eyes, that's kind of what you do, right? At Legacy Tree Genealogists? That's exactly right. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we can perform a full service genealogical research and report for you, if that's what you're looking for. Or, as we mentioned earlier, if you're just simply looking for um, a little boost, you want someone to look over your research, give you some ideas of where to go next, additional resources that might be available to you. We offer the Genealogist on Demand. It's a a virtual consultation. You're talking to a genealogist live about your project, your problem, your family, and we're helping you to come up with some solutions. Love it. Well, if you want more information on those options for you and those resources, uh, head to the show notes because we have a link there to help get you over to the right place. Kate, thanks again. Always such a delight to talk to you. And thanks for helping us get a better handle on our evidence and our proof. Thank you very much, Lisa. I hope you enjoyed this conversation about evidence and proof. And I want to direct you to the article that Kate and I were talking about. Uh, This is just a terrific article packed with examples that you can take a look at and really um, get a sense of what she was talking about, about evaluating your sources and really making the determination if you have what it takes to constitute proof. The article is called Genealogical Evidence and Proof, How to Know if You've Compiled Enough Evidence. I will have a link in the show notes for this episode to take you over there so you can read through the article, check out her examples, compare it to what you're doing in your own research. 
And if you feel like you could use a fresh set of eyes on your own genealogical brick wall, the folks at Legacy Tree Genealogists really can help you out in a really quick and affordable way. Kate, along with all the other professional genealogists there who have specialties in many different areas, are available to help. So if you're looking for some assistance in your research, tap into their Genealogist On Demand service. This is a 45-minute virtual consultation just for you, one-on-one, 45 minutes with a professional genealogist to really evaluate where you've been and where you need to go to get past your brick walls. For just $100 USD, you can get their help in determining the research strategies that you need to move forward confidently in your research. You can schedule your appointment right there on their website at LegacyTree.com slash Genealogy Gems dash consultation. That's LegacyTree.com slash Genealogy Gems dash consultation. And of course, when you head to our show notes for this episode 240, you will also find a link there as well. And of course, be sure and tell them that you heard about them here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. Thanks so much for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 240. Now we covered a lot of information in this episode, so you're going to definitely want to head to the show notes. And there you'll find all the notes, the links, pictures, all that kind of good stuff. Head to genealogygems.com and under podcast, click on the Genealogy Gems podcast. As soon as I wrap this episode up, I'm going to be going and putting the finishing touches on the Family Tree Magazine podcast. And so look for that. That usually comes out around the 20th of the month. Again, I hope next time we talk here on the podcast, um, everything is back up and running again, and we're moving full force forward, healthy and happy. Uh, Take care of yourself. And thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.